Recently, we found these two volumes in our house. They had belonged to my father-in-law, who has passed on now, and that was a few years ago. And what these are, are handmade volumes that were put together by his father-in-law, my wife's grandfather. And he was a man named Elwood. We'll see here, right in the beginning, Elwood Lutz. It's a good uh, Lancaster County name. And you can also see this is Photographs of World War II as published by Life Magazine. You see the dates listed there. And Elwood put these together. He was a typesetter with the local newspaper, the Lancaster New Era, and I guess the Intelligencer Journal. So both of these are the same this way. These are just humongous books. They have a couple of hunks of end papers here. And then we get down to this. So what I thought we would do is just take a look at these two wonderful volumes. So let's just stack them up here real quick. I'll see if I can do this uh, one-handed. Not exactly easy. Here they are. Book one, book two. They really are something. These things have been sitting in boxes and they were just packed away. Nobody messed with them, but as you can see, for all my fellow book nerds and book lovers, you know, as it were, you can just see these things are incredibly well made. Elwood did a fine job. He was definitely very good at his craft working for the paper, doing what he did. So here we are, and let's have a good look at these books. I'm going to break this down into smaller chunks because it's going to take a while to get through these, and we certainly want to give the images and the history the care that it deserves. So let's dive in. Okay, and here we go. This is book one. See what we've got here. This just appears to be some very simple paper stock here. Uh, not surprisingly newsprint, I would imagine. Great for art projects. So I will just double check here. We are in volume one, book one here. Again, we can see it was arranged by Elwood Lutz. And so here's the first image. And isn't this interesting? Now, I would imagine that hopefully many of you looking at this are even better historians than I am. But uh, it doesn't take a degree in history to see the interesting irony of that page as opposed to what's going on in the world right now. This is often how this stuff starts. And so the date listed here is September 4th, 1939. And a lot of things happened uh, before that that led up to this moment. Nazis and Red Pact. And it is interesting how they were, how they used language back then. Um, you know, the kind of like uh, slurs and colloquialisms and different things like that were just a part of the vernacular. And so, you know, that's, that's how the paper talked, too. They weren't trying to sugarcoat it. The uh, ridiculous amounts of, you know, effort that are now put into not offending everybody, you know, it was certainly not a concern back then. And so you're going to see a lot of that when we look through this. You're going to see a lot of uh, antiquated language you know, for good or for bad. Uh, I'm not saying I like it. It's just history. It says here, Nazi Foreign Minister von Rivenstrop left stands beside Soviet dictator Stalin as Russia's Molotov signs non-aggression pact in Moscow. Boy, 
We all know how badly that went eventually. Isn't that something just to see the way they did that? So that's 13 and there's 14. So here's a heck of a picture. This is a Danzig Nazi seizure of a free city threatens second Sarajevo. Down here it says Germany's Schleswig-Holstein, a training ship, entered, entered Danzig on August 25th and fired the first salute for a local Nazi chief. This was the only picture released by Germany that day. We'll do a, we'll do a pull in on that so you can get a better look at it. And this is showing you the map, trying to give you a uh, kind of a tactical overview of it. And then there's just this wonderful drawing. And it's incredibly well done. Someone named Hugh Ferris. If we just read a little bit about what it says here, the drawing at the right shows the heart of last week's war crisis, the pleasant and picturesque city of Danzig. The bitter German-Polish dispute over its status has magnified into a prospective Sarajevo of the Second World War. Poland. Could her staunch army stand alone against the German might? Does that sound familiar? Hmm, right? I mean, of course it does. You could just change a few of those words. You change that to Ukraine. Change that to Russian. You're seeing the same things. And so I suppose historically, you know, when you ignore things like this or you allow them to pass, you're creating a situation that you either politically want or don't want. I'm not sure what the Allies had in mind by ignoring it. Uh, there was a lot of sentiment for isolationism in America at the time. And uh, people who don't see history clearly often go that way. But they do it with good reason. Uh, they have good intentions anyway, uh, especially when you think about how much money we just spent in uh, the Far East and the Middle East on war. You know, it's, you could just kind of see the same situation lining itself up again. Lots of bad memories lead to nobody wanting a repeat. There's always some idiot willing to sacrifice life for their own personal aspirations. That guy doesn't even have to be that smart, does he? Just has to be able to get people on his side. So what it says here is as 45 crack German divisions stood massed on Polish borders, primed to sweep in north, south, and west in a crushing double envelopment attack, arrows on map indicate main avenues of advance. All of the world knew that Adolf Hitler, all the world knew that for Adolf Hitler, the rape of Poland represented first and foremost simply one more step in his ambition to dominate all Europe. Isn't that an interesting use of uh, language there? All the world knew that for Adolf Hitler, the rape of Poland, just like the Russians did in Ukraine, their initial push into Ukraine, there were daily reports of rape of women and children and men of all ages by the Russian army, because it was an army of conscripts and they were undisciplined and out of control not professionals. So with what the Germans are doing there in that article, it's more of a figurative thing, but uh, you know, history would say it wasn't completely figurative. So over here, it says here, Europe, could Poland's friends break Axis wall in time to save her? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? The tremendous and terrible obstacle facing Britain and France in an attempt to help Poland against Nazi attack is shown on this map. Here in stark outline is the basic and perhaps controlling strategical situation of the crisis and the war or peace to follow. Well, there was certainly no peace. So 
We have a 17 at 18. Here's a uh, interesting image of some German troops that march into a Siegfried line fort through armored gas proof door. Sign over the portal reads Schnarnhorst Fort Group. Heavy Fort 1238. So here we see some Nazi thugs in these various images. The Great Wall is manned by 500,000 German soldiers. Observation turret, underground tunnels. Non-coms emerge from the blockhouse. The hole at the left is an air intake. The Germans had some interesting tricks on their air intakes too because some of them were uh, actually holes and if you dropped a grenade in, the grenade would drop out at your feet. It was designed to fool attackers into dropping grenades on themselves. I don't know if that was specifically there, but it was used elsewhere. And this says, New German Army. Its mass might has never fought a war and never muffed a conquest. That didn't really slow them down too much. Here's a German corporal in profile. It's a listing of men and machines. And of course, it's always well worth keeping in mind that any leader that needs military war parades like that to bolster his ego isn't a guy you really want on the world scene. Think about all the countries where they do things like this. Sooner or later, they just start killing people. I have to say that the photography, though, really is astounding. As uh, someone who's done photography you know, all of my life, I've always been fascinated by the quality of the uh, photographic work in these old life magazines. There really aren't a lot of people out watching that. German infantry, cavalry, and motor units parade through Berlin's Tiergarten. Here are the goose-stepping soldiers, German artillery, secret German airfields. I guess a lot of this is just kind of talking around the fact that the Germans weren't supposed to develop a military uh, like this uh, according to agreements and treaties, but they did. Here it says in America, the uh, pres uh, president appeals for peace. The U.S. and the Reds, the U.S. Reds squirm for Stalin. America's first reaction to news of the Hitler-Stalin deal was a great cynical guffaw reflected in the cartoons on the opposite page. So, these cartoons. It is kind of interesting to see. Clearly, uh, Russia knew what it was getting itself into, but I guess people on this end of the equation still had to show their disdain for it, but they were buying time. I, think, I don't think they ever strategically fooled themselves for a minute that there would be any kind of truly honored agreement. The war of nerves keeps Europe teetering for a week on the brink of the War of Guns. And I mean, these people are all just such a part of history now. Europe's children, war fought in city streets, drives them from their homes. That's one thing you could see there is that uh, kids definitely had a better sense of style back then. <laughs> A 
it says here 650,000 children clutching their kits and gas masks with names and addresses tagged around necks were evacuated from London September 1 through the 3rd. And my mom would have been about this old living uh, right on the outskirts of London. Her and her mother used to drive into, uh, or no, I'm sorry, walk into London uh, after it was bombed sometimes to see if they could help or see what they could get. Of course, they just also needed to get food and different things like that. But my mom lived right on the outskirts of London, like many of these children probably did. She was lucky to survive. So here it says the German army invades Poland. Adolf Hitler puts on his uniform and takes everything on victory. Polish women and children dig air raid trenches in Warsaw, August 28th, before the statue of Poland's war dead. Here was one of the first picture of a German army actually going into action against the Poles. In Soldier's Field Gray, Hitler in, is congratulated by Reichstag after announcing September 1st in Kroll Opera House that the German army had invaded Poland that morning. So I guess if you're amassing an army on someone's borders, there's a pretty good chance you'll invade and start killing them for whatever reasons. Twenty years of peace, how Europe worked its way from the war to end war to the war of 1939, which may end Europe. There's an interesting documentary called The Architecture of Doom that talks about how Hitler and the Nazis uh, had an aesthetic desire to destroy all of Europe uh, so that it could look like a work of art from antiquity and then they would uh, maniacally rebuild it in the image that they preferred it to be in. And so they had this all laid out and they had the plans in place. And so all they had to do was destroy everything. Nazi fascism is a death cult. And so it requires things to be destroyed and lots of people to die so that there can be a rebirth of sorts. It's a disgusting philosophy. Nazis kill the chancellor of a friendly state, Austria's little uh, Engelbert Dollfuss, in his own chancellery at 1 p.m. July 25th, 1934. Soon after blood purge, here brave little Dollfuss's body lies where he bled to death on his rose and cream Louis XV office divan. So... That's how they treat their friends. You know you don't want to be their enemy, right? And this really is an amazing layout of photos here. It's, it's very well done. And it just kind of shows a lot of what's going on. Czechoslovakia's general, Sarovi, mourns at the grave of Czechoslovakia's founder, Tomis, Tomis uh, Garugu Masaryk. I am butchering that, sorry about that, on the 20th anniversary of Czechoslovakia's birth. On October 28, 1938, there was still hope Czech Czechoslovakia might remain largely free. Yeah. Very few people got out unscathed from all of this, I guess. Europe's black Europe blacks out. Air raid fears put city in darkness. That's an interesting example of how they darken a town to make it harder to hit from the air. A salvo is fired by the 15-inch guns of a British battleship's A and X turrets. This ship belongs to the Queen Elizabeth battleship class and is much the same as the Barham and Malaya type shown 
third from the bottom right in the drawing at the top of the page. If she entered the Baltic without a base at hand, she would have to keep moving, could last about nine days without having to come out of the Baltic to refuel. Two of these ships have been refitted and now resemble the War Sprite, also shown in the drawing. So that would be all of these guys up above. It's an interesting, interesting way of showing it to the world. And uh, this, this really does highlight something that's uh, pretty amazing about the American Army now. Uh, there's nobody in the world who does logistics like we do. And our enemies know it. So this is where we'll stop for this video. And this is War Plans in the Mediterranean.